Good morning. How's everyone? I know we just had a really great panel and excited to be with you all uh, this morning. And of course, happy um, Women's History Month to everyone. We, I think this conversation today is one that really connects to the conversation we're hoping to have as a part of this forum all day. So my name is Latricia Boone. I um, am a former member of the US Chamber team. I actually led uh, an important piece of work called Equality of Opportunity, but I am now serving as founder of a firm called Core Strategy Consulting Group, where I get to work with just some amazing companies, organizations, others who are trying to make impact as it relates to equity. And so I get to support their capacity, help them to be more efficient and effective. And the conversation we're gonna have now is really connected to that work that I do work that I've done through the US Chamber and other spaces, but even more importantly, connected to my personal mission as it relates to financial inclusion and financial empowerment. So this panel, um, I have a great group of women leaders in this space who we're gonna talk with. And what I'm gonna do is really, as opposed to you all individually doing um, intros right now, we are just going to, I'm gonna open up with a question. And then as a part of responding to that question, give you a chance to share a little bit about your background and experience and what led you to this work. So thank you. So my first guest uh, right here to my left is um, Jennifer Kingston, who is actually with um, Edward Jones. <laughs> so. Jennifer, you know, the question that I really have is, if you could talk a little bit about, as we think about financial inclusion, financial empowerment, what are two to three goals in the work that you do at Edward Jones, um, and how did you get to this role? Yeah, absolutely. So good morning. Uh, wonderful to be here with you all today and honored to get to serve as part of this panel. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jennifer Kingston, and I am the head of diversity, equity, and inclusion at Edward Jones. So at Edward Jones, we are guided by our purpose, which is to partner for positive impact, to improve the lives of our clients and colleagues, and together better our communities and society. We live out our purpose in a number of different ways, um, but one of those key ways is really part of what we're focused on here today, and that's partnering for lasting financial strength. So when we think about ways um, in the communities that we serve that we're helping promote that equitable growth, I would focus on really key, uh, three key initiatives. So first is around financial literacy. So in 2020, Edward Jones started its own financial fitness program with the goal really to help educate and provide access to more young women and girls in learning about financial education. Since 2020, we've reached 450,000 learners. Uh, so we're almost halfway to our bold goal of having 1 million learners by the end of 2025. Um, again, we believe that by having that solid base of financial education, that's gonna pull through to financial empowerment, which will ultimately lead to financial strength. Second, I would highlight some work that we do related to legislative advocacy. Um, we have a grassroots task force at our firm, which is made up of financial advisors and branch team support members throughout the country. They actually partner with our policy and government relations group, many of whom are here today, uh, and they work throughout the year to have conversations with our legislators about topics that are important to our clients, like financial education. We believe those conversations are important because we think that they will help provide financial stability for more Americans. And then finally, I would highlight the work that we're doing to help college be more accessible and affordable for more families. So Edward Jones, for the last 20 years, has offered 529 savings plans. Um, we help parents and grandparents, close family members, help them save and invest in their loved one's future for college. Uh, we offer 21 different 529 plans, and currently our clients have about $14.6 billion saved in those plans today for future college education. Wow, that's a great impact, and we're gonna come back to the, the question around financial literacy, and particularly working with uh, younger generations and building that uh, knowledge. So Kelly Lannon with Fidelity, wanna hear the same question. What are two or three goals that you have in your work, and talk a little bit about how you came to your work at Fidelity. Great, well hi everyone, good morning. Um, my name is Kelly Lannon, I work at Fidelity Investments, and my role is to really engage our next generation of customers through our products, through our service, through our marketing, and then very relevant to this topic, our financial education. Um, so us at Fidelity, we really believe 
believe that it is so important to break down barriers and make sure that everyone has access to financial literacy, uh, financial education, because we truly believe that education can actually lead to financial inclusion, can lead to empowerment. Um, and empowerment then leads to opportunity. And we do this through a wide range of things from showing up on campus, whether that's at universities or colleges, uh, showing up in the classroom of grades K through 12, and also making sure that we're educating teachers as well. Um, how many teachers have told us, and I don't know if any of you know teachers, like, wow, they're, they're the absolute best, who've actually said, man, we believe in this education, but we ourselves, we don't feel confident enough to deliver it as well. We're doing it through employers, we're doing it on social media, we're doing it through a wide range of forums. Now, I say that, and I just think it is really important to note, it's not enough just to provide the education in these areas. Like, how many times I've given a talk and the first thing I say to everyone is that, hey, I bet you guys didn't wake up in the morning and say, 11 a.m., I'm gonna go learn about financial literacy, right? Like, does anyone, well, maybe this group, but most students especially, they're not like super stoked to do that first thing. So it is equally important to us that the content we're putting out is we're meeting people where they are. We're creating, you know, small tidbits of information that people consume very quickly. I'm sure some of y'all have heard the stat, actually. The younger generation, specifically Gen Z, Google actually came out with this. They are going to TikTok over Google to Google something, yeah. right? So like the term we use, we're gonna go Google it, they're like, I'm gonna go TikTok it. So we're making sure we're showing up in those platforms. We're making sure we're understanding the customers we're facing and creating education directly for them. We're putting it in different formats. We're putting it in different mediums because that is equally as important to making sure that we're showing up in the right spot. And then tying back to my direct work, which I'll touch upon later, um, I am targeting our next generation of customers, our younger customers. Um, man, I wish that um, I learned a little bit growing up. Like, how many in this audience made so many money mistakes when you were young? Anyone? Anyone want to raise their hand along with me? Yes, great, awesome. I think all of us were, right? I graduated college and I was like, who the heck is teaching me anything? So anyways, I just say that because my job is directly to hit people when they're young. We believe that as we start young, it's empowering them for future generations and we're making sure that we're doing it sooner rather than later as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelly. And again, we're gonna come back to that next generation piece because I do think it's really important. But I do want to turn to Nan Morrison with the Council for Economic Education, which I know the next generation piece is also really important to the work that you all do. But share a little bit about those two to three main goals you have at the Council. It is, and I'm going to echo some of the words you've already heard, which is good, it means we're all on the same page. <laughs> so the mission of the Council for Economic Education is to teach K through 12 kids about personal finance and economics, give them those tools so that they can make better decisions for themselves, their families, and how appropriate at the US Chamber, their communities. So we really have three big goals. One, obviously the first one is knowledge. It's the language of money, the grammar, the vocabulary, the tools, budgeting, investing. By the way, we don't teach kids how to write checks anymore because nobody writes checks, so please don't say that. Uh, the second thing that's really important, everybody says, oh, you teach kids how to write checks? No, well, not really. I don't even write checks anymore. So um, the second thing is uh, about confidence. It's not about knowing every detail of every last financial decision you're ever going to have to make, especially when you're 10 or 12 or 14, but just having the confidence to ask that question. It's also really important that the teachers are confident. So we do a lot of teacher training. Actually, Fidelity has helped us with that. Uh, because if you have confident teachers, they feel more confident and more able to teach their students in ways that are going to reach those kids because they don't wake up in the morning, as you said, saying, I'm going to go learn about financial education today. So, so the last thing that we care about is access, which is a common theme, I think, across all of us. Why? Only 24 states require personal finance to be taught before a child can graduate. So what does that mean? That means in half the country, and there are some big states in that half. Kids aren't getting access to this education, and it will come no as no surprise to most of you in this room that the kids who, in those states, really have no access are primarily from low and moderate income communities. So knowledge, confidence, and access is what we're focused on. We advocate for these requirements, we train the teachers, we provide fun stuff for the kids, and hopefully, uh, and, and later on, we'll talk more about some very specific, a very specific program we have for uh, girls, and in particular, girls of color, so that they have all of those tools at their disposal. Thank you, and you're leading into what the next question will be on the access side, but I wanna go to my colleague at the very end, <laughs> Jennifer Gerano-Oxley with the Motley Fool Foundation. Um, and 
going forward, I'm gonna say JGO, because she gave me permission to do so, <laughs> since we have two Jennifers on the panel. But again, at the Motley Fool Foundation, talk a little bit about the work you're doing there, and what are two to three goals that you all have in this space? Happy to do so. Really happy to be here to back home at the chamber, because Latricia and I were talking about earlier, I had a stint at the chamber in my early 30s, uh, and really enjoyed that experience. But the Motley Fool, um, I think the reality for us is that our vision is to create a world that's smarter, happier, and richer. So for the last 30 years, this is actually our 30th anniversary, we've partnered with many people on this stage um, to help people become investors at whatever amount that is, to envision yourself at being investors. So our goal in general is always to increase those numbers, um, but it's also to diversify those people that are actually at the table in a wealth-building tool like investing. Um, the second is that we have a venture fund we started a couple years ago. The venture fund was meant to do two things. One was to actually invest in women-owned firms, in minority-owned firms, but also look at who disperses the money. So instead of having the typical number of limited partners, there are 800 limited partners, and many of those are women. So women are investing in other women businesses, and we partner with organizations like Portfolio to make that happen because we want to make sure that women have the opportunity to control where the money goes. Isn't that lovely? And I'm sitting in a room with mostly women um, and, a lot, and a lot of wonderful allies. And the third was to start the Motley Fool Foundation, uh, which happened three years ago I came on. It is a public charity of the Motley Fool. Two goals, really simply. One was to leverage the membership. So over time, the millions of members of the Motley Fool have decided to pay it forward. And that membership wants to help us create pathways, remove barriers for people living paycheck to paycheck, which also involves literacy to some extent. Um, but the other side of it is to think about there's only so much that's in someone's control. So the second piece that we're working on is systems, and the systems that either allow us to be a part of the game or take us out of the game. And I'm talking about housing, health, education, work, and money. So many of us are doing amazing work in all of those areas. Our goal at the foundation is to figure out what's missing in the cracks. Why do people who are living paycheck to paycheck continually fall through the cracks? And sometimes it's not due to their own control. So we're trying to innovate in those cracks, bridge build in those spaces, disrupt systems if necessary, but really collectively redesign the, the world we want to live in. So those four areas. Yeah, thank you. And I think in so many ways you really led into my next question. So as you all think about your work, and I'm gonna ask all of our panelists to respond to this question as well. As you think about your work, you, you already talked in so many ways about literacy and knowledge and equipping folks with access, uh, supporting family really um, to be able, and building pathways. But how are you, can you talk more specifically about how you're addressing some of those gaps that we know exist for women as we think about financial inclusion, financial empowerment? What are ways that you're helping to address those gaps that exist? And, and even maybe talk about a little bit more about what those gaps are from the work you're doing and what you've seen. And I'm actually gonna uh, twist it up a little bit. And so I'll start with Kelly actually to, to answer the, this question, but I'm gonna look for all of our panelists to respond. Yeah, great. So I'll just share a few things that we're doing at Fidelity to, to really specifically help women. And as, as you already noted, you know, we, we do see a gap when it comes to women and men. And then we see a gap when it comes with women with and without children as well. Um, I, have a, I have two children. I have a four-month-old. Um, I still woke up at 4 a.m. thinking I heard her crying. She's like millions of miles away right now. So mm -hmm. yeah, motherhood, great, right, guys? So it's really hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, I just say that in a few examples is, you know, the first is we actually have built up uh, a community for women um, called Women Talk Money. Um, at the start of the pandemic, and candidly even before, we had so many women reaching out to us asking for help asking us to help answer their questions. And what we also found is that they were getting just as much from our responses as they were from the other women in the room or some of their friends or you know, talking among some Fidelity representatives. So we decided, you know what, let's actually stand up a community for this woman. Um, and right now, Women Talk Money is over 300,000 strong. We actually are seeing people take action after attending you know, our forums. We have a whole series of events actually throughout this month. So um, I urge you to take advantage and take a look. I think actually Jessica Alba is in our event today. And then we have Venus Williams later in the month as well. So we're really excited about our lineup. And we're addressing topics of you know, investing you know, for your kids. We're addressing topics of even how to start 
start investing, how to do a better job saving, not spending as much. So we're really trying to empower women because we're, we're seeing is that when women have that education, they're really excelling. The other area too, and I'm sure some of my panelists here will talk about this too, is teen girls. Um, as I mentioned, I spend a lot of my time thinking about our next generation of customers and you know, candidly, the data is staggering and a little upsetting. Um, we're seeing teen girls not feel as confident as teen boys when it comes to investing. We see them asking for education. Um, we actually launched a, a product um, about a year and a half ago, the youth account, where teens can actually start investing on their own. We're still seeing more teen boys than teen girls sign up. The other thing too is that the parent who's actually helping to open the account, the majority is the dad, it is not the mom. So this is a problem that we continually need to address. And in terms of teen girls, not only are we working our darndest to try to beef up that education, meet them where we are, and let them know that fidelity is on their side, but we're also trying to figure out better ways to show up. Um, you know, we have a partnership with the Connecticut Sun where we're actually working with them to um, start, you know, targeting and working with young female athletes. Um, we have a, a learning lab, which I've already kind of alluded to, where we're actually working to, to train individual teachers who are in the classrooms day in and day out with these kids. And as I already mentioned, the youth account project with the product, excuse me, that we're continuing trying to evolve with a better lens on how can we actually empower and give teen girls confidence. Um, I truly believe that we can make a difference, every single one in this room, and I'm excited to hear what the rest of you guys are doing too. Yeah, thank you for that. As a mom of a teen, someone who will be a teen girl this year, I, I love hearing that because I do think often about, you know, what I'm transferring to her and what she may not be getting as a result of things that I didn't get at her age or in other spaces. So I appreciate just that. Just real quick, I, sorry, just one more second. Um, I, I don't know if anyone saw recently the New York Times came out with an article saying like how much teen girls are feeling sadness compared oh, yeah. to men. And yeah, it was definitely like, saw it. And there's just, more articles I like know, that out there. so many, and I just can't believe it. And yep. so I think it's so important to also acknowledge we're here talking a little bit more finance, but your financial health is so linked to your mental health. To everything and else. if we can help them in them one area, hopefully it will also help them in other things too. Yeah, so, okay, absolutely. I'll shut up now. No, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> JGO, talk to us a little bit about the Motley Fool Foundation. What are ways that you all are addressing those gaps or barriers? And the other thing I'm thinking about too is because women are not a monolith and coming from so many different backgrounds and experiences, how are we addressing those differences and cultural competency as we are also addressing some of those gaps and barriers? You know, I'll speak to it from both the Fool and the Foundation, is we are two separate organizations yeah. within the same brand. Um, the Fool, we talked about it earlier. In 2022, 1.9% of VC venture capital funding went to women-owned businesses. This 2022, and it was 1.9%. So the, the venture fund for us is a really important initiative to make sure we are, re again, focusing on who owns the money and is distributing the money and also being really intentional about the businesses that we invest in. The second thing is we recently started a rule breaker program. So the Motley Fool is known as rule breaker stocks and ultimately it was a program that was targeted at, and right now we're just in the process of getting it going, but there's a lot of different fellowships out there for entrepreneurs. Um, but the reality is the majority of those fellowships are either for early stage or mature entrepreneurs. And there is a missing middle again, back to those gaps. There is a missing middle of entrepreneurs who are largely women and the interesting thing about that is they're not being supported in the same way. So our fellowship does support entrepreneurs, innovators in each one of those areas, but also connects their work to figure out how we help their constituents not fall through the cracks. Um, and I think the third thing is really akin to what you were just talking about, Kelly, around, you know, we create our existence in community as women, and we do that with our allies and otherwise. And so we use organizations and fellowships and partnerships to create things like investors like me. Because when you see someone that looks like you that's doing the thing, which you do so well, Nan, and you're talking about Kelly, I mean, ultimately, you want to be in those shoes. You want to learn how to do it. So we have something called Investors Like Me, which ultimately highlights those full members that have taken the journey up, down, and all around, but have stayed in the game. And I think the reality of investing is it's actually meant to be for the long term, but you need to have the capital to be able to do that. So I love looking at your work um, with uh, Women Talk and then uh, investing in girls, but many of us in this room are doing those kind of things. Imagine if we actually started talking about those things together. Mm -hmm. Then it would feel like there are more of us really focusing and how many more women would really get involved. So that's why I'm excited to hang out with my neighbors here because I think there's opportunities for us to work together and think about how we pool our resources and or even the narrative around women making progress. 
Yeah, I mean, partnership is hugely critical. I talk about that with clients that I get to work with. And I, I really appreciate you also talking about how we take the mystery out of some things and open up welcoming spaces where folks feel comfortable. So Jennifer, talk a little bit about it, Edward Jones. Like how, how are you all addressing some of those gaps? Absolutely, so I love how you were really drilling down on this idea that there are cultural differences as well, that not every woman, not every young girl is the same. So I'm gonna kind of approach it from two different angles. So first from a systemic angle, um, as I mentioned, we have our financial fitness program. It is providing that day-to-day -day education and learning and understanding relating to those basic financial concepts, saving, investing, how do we talk differently um, and make finance not so scary um, to people. I know when I first thought about coming to Edward Jones, I was like, I can't can't possibly work there. I know nothing about finances. Mm -hmm. They won't hire me. <laughs> yeah. um, and so just getting through that mindset of even being afraid to even enter into the conversation about it. So through our financial fitness program, we offer both digital free online um, resources where you can go on our website and actually take the course on your own. Um, we know that different people learn different ways. And so we want to have that angle. But we also offer in school programming. So since we started in 2020, we've had 60,000 high school students go through our program um, in over 1,000 schools throughout the country, 53% of those were deemed high need schools. So we're really trying to provide that programming in the areas that need it most. I'll say in 2022 alone, um, we actually had 32,000 high school students participate in the program, but we had another 38,000 online learners, so people seeking it out. So we know that the, the desire is there to learn and do more. Um, I'll say that from an individualistic standpoint, I do think there's work that each of us could be doing every single day. So I do want to highlight that for a minute. When I think about the power that each of us could have to uplift young women and girls in our communities and our workplaces, if we actually took the time to listen and to understand and to hear and see the unique differences that people are experiencing and to really learn their stories, I think we could make an incredible impact. Uh, one of my favorite words is Sonder. Uh, at Edward Jones, we have this thing where you pick a word of the year and I'm refusing to change my word. Every year is gonna be Sonder from now on out. Um, it's that powerful realization that every single person that you pass by in the street, every stranger you meet is living a life as vivid and complex as your own. So why does that matter? Why do we care? Well, imagine the impact that we could make if every single person in this room committed today to say, I am going to listen and learn. I'm going to hear the stories. I'm going to understand the unique perspective of these young girls and women. We could really close that gap between intention and impact. So I would encourage each of us to think not just in our system and the processes that we have in place, but what can we do on an individual basis to help close that gap? Yeah, I, there's so many things that we can pivot off from there. I really, I just really love that because I think as we go into spaces and recognize that people are coming and experiencing different things and listening is so important. So thank you for that. And Nan, for the work that you do at the Council for Economic Education, I mean, something Jennifer just said struck me, and I know you're gonna talk about barriers in general, but you were talked about coming into Edward Jones and saying, I don't know anything about financial. And I do think that sometimes for women, that may be a perspective that we have. And I, I know you're doing work with young women to help turn that around. So can you talk about mm -hmm. some of those we, things? We are, and uh, like everybody else uh, here and out here, I'm sure, you have to be very deliberate about this. Yeah. So, so one thing we do is we have a big national challenge called the National Personal Finance Challenge and we very deliberately went after kids who might be a little afraid of entering it and now we're 50-50 men and women and we've moved the needle by 30 percent on children of color that participate. We're just a few points shy of the national average for the number of black and brown children in the country versus the number that are participating. We did that in three years. We made a decision we went for it. The, probably the, the, the most visible and obvious thing we do is this program called Invest in Girls. And that has two major goals. One is to teach girls about personal finance. Uh, and we do that in an environment that works for them. So sometimes it's a lot easier to talk about stuff with people who are like you, right? So actually, one of my colleagues tells this great story about budgets. Uh, working on budgets with the girls, and they were had a big conversation about how much they budget for hair products. Now, this was 40 minutes of getting blown dry. My hair is like this. <laughs> I totally, totally related to that conversation. I would never have that with a bunch of guys in the room. I just wouldn't, right? It wouldn't be proper in the business world that I came from. The second thing that we do, and this is the really important one that, again, all of, all of you can help with, 
is we introduce girls to careers in finance and financial services because that, those, that means jobs and that means economic mobility and financial stability. And I'm not talking about Wall Street, I'm talking about Main Street. And that's what I love about this program because every organization, every town, no matter where you are, has somebody that manages the money. And once you are comfortable with the words, the vocabulary around doing it for yourself, you know, it's not so foreign. It demystifies it was the word that you used. And then there's a path to a job. So can I say a little bit more about this, this program? Please, I would, yes. So um, this is actually the third question I got to go first on it. So, so, <laughs> so, there, so in finan financial foundations, it's not just about teaching about money. That's the CFO module. In the CIO, investing, and then CEO module, we also talk about um, life skills, right? Because not every girl in these programs, and it's really focused on girls of color from low and moderate income communities, about 75% of our girls fall into that category. You don't have a mom or an aunt nan who has these PowerPoints scattered all over their desk all the time, right? It's just a different universe. So, so a, a big part of that is teaching about what, what is a presentation about? How do I speak? What do I put on my resume? All of the things where you might not have somebody in your life that, that has that experience that can help you with that and you may be afraid to ask. The second piece of this is this whole career exploration process. And we actually start that very early with just introducing the girls to people that look like the women on this panel, but hopefully some that look a little bit more like them as well. Why? Because it's not so scary to meet people like us, right? We happen to work in finance, but we're just women who happen to do this for a living. And the other important thing is to take them into the workplace. I know we've been virtual for a long time, but actually being in the workplace, meeting other people, getting the vibe, it's a new experience to a lot of these, these girls. We do some of our programs on college campuses. Some girls have never been to a college campus, never, don't even live near them. So all of this experiential learning is really important. It increases the confidence and the comfort. So, so this program really makes a difference to a lot of young girls. They tell us they become, they're gonna study accounting, they're gonna study math, they're gonna study economics. It just opens up doors of possibility to them. And that's why it's a program that's really, really dear to my heart. And um, anyway, any one of you can get involved. Just call, bring it to your school. <laughs> we, we need volunteer mentors, which is a much more formal program. We need people to go into the classroom and just say, hey, this is what I do for a living. So. Yeah, I want to actually follow up on that a bit because I, I love hearing this. And I'm wondering how long does a young woman kind of stay in the program? Like what does the course of it look like? And if you have, if you can even paint the picture for our audience of what that experience is like from the time they come into a course or start to work with you all to they've now been exposed to this new world potentially, all these rich opportunities. And even if they don't decide to go into a financial career, you still need these skill sets for life. Right, so the first part of the program has, I don't know, 18, 18 lessons, that sounds like a lot, but it's, you can do it within a semester, especially if it's an all-girls school. You can do it as an after-school program, if it's a co-ed school. We do some camps if people want to put it together for a, for a camp for a week. It's a little bit more intensive. Um, and that's all the fin financial foundations, but we always introduce the girls to real-life women who are doing this stuff for real. Um, in the second piece, Career Explorations, uh, that um, happens in different ways. It can happen over two or three weeks. We introduce them to a set of careers. Uh, we, have, we ask people for fellowships so that the girls over spring break when they're juniors or seniors can come into workplaces. We have this all mapped out so you don't actually have to think too hard about it. We can just give it to you and say, oh, here's how it would work for us. Um, and then uh, for a mentorship program, we actually do ask for a commitment of once a month uh, with uh, your student over the course of the school year and then some activities where we bring all the students and their mentors together because a big piece of this is creating economic connectedness. Read Raj Chetty, right? It matters. One of my honorary nieces, math and econ at college, I saw her this weekend. Well, she's looking for a summer job. Aunt Nan knows people at the Fed. Not everybody has an Aunt Nan who can make those introductions. So the kinds of connectedness that can happen between all of the mentors and all of the girls, because these are girls without those naturally 
occurring networks are really, really critical. So, you know, even if a girl starts this when she's a senior, she can get a lot of financial foundations in in her first semester. She can do some fellowships the second semester, and then she's ready to rock. And our mentorship program includes girls in their first year of college. We're really only K-12, but we do that because this program is so important. Thank you. Just appreciate it for our audience to really hear what that trajectory Thanks. looks like. So we're getting close to time, and I feel like we could go on much, much longer. <laughs> but I want to ask a last question to all of our panelists, and that's really around a call to action or what folks in this room can do. We, you, that has come up in several responses already, but let's like make this crystal clear. What are things that you want folks to walk away with and how what we can do to really help to advance the great work that you all are doing, either as an individual, as a company, as an organization, whatever that looks like. And I'll start with you, Jenna. Okay, I'm gonna be quick, being mindful of time. So we've spent most of our time talking about um, how we can help girls and, and women in the communities. I'd also suggest that we look inward and start that change within our own company. So I'll highlight two quick things. At Edward Jones, uh, two years ago, we set bold 2025 representation goals where we put our North Star and said that by the end of 2025, we want gender parity in every single home office leadership roles. You need to go out there, set reach goals, um, really push your own employees inside your company to make sure you're having um, conversations not just outside our walls but inside as well. And we use our business resource groups to really focus on attraction, retention, career development, community engagement, and we bring important conversations like last week. Uh, Lamel wasn't part of a great conversation about how do we close the wealth gap between black and brown communities and white communities. And so we're ensuring we have that education not just outside our four walls but also inside, so I would encourage everyone to ensure that you're looking inward as well. Thank you for lifting that up, because it's so important for us to actually make change. Yeah, yes, so, Kelly, so I'll sorry. go Knox. First <laughs> yeah. of all, I wish I had an Aunt Nan and your hair looks fabulous. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, no, but with the limited time, the only thing I have to say is a very specific call to action is that when you leave the, these walls, when you leave this building after day, just talk to one person. Right? Let's start small, because I think like the small things, they can continue to grow from there. You know, Financial Literacy Month is coming up in April and we're launching a whole campaign to just do one thing, because we truly believe that of all 70,000 individuals who work at Fidelity, just do one simple thing to advance financial literacy, financial education out there in the community, we can make a big difference. So just talk to one person when you leave her. I think y'all can do that, okay? And report back to me, okay? One person. One person. <laughs> <laughs> and then inside focus. Yeah. So we've got two action items. Nan. So I had two things. One of them was actually exactly that. Yeah, Aunt Nan. Awesome. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> go, go. Just do, do one thing. Call your do school, one thing. volunteer to be a role model and talk to a classroom of kids. Bring Invest in Girls to your local school. The second thing is we created a partnership with FinEd50 and a number of other not-for-profits and uh, real companies called FinEd50. You can go to the website, it's called fined50.org, um, and it's about advocating to get requirements passed in every state, because half the kids are being left out right now, and you know that's not an equal half. That's the kids, a lot of those kids are the ones that need it the most, who just don't have access, and it makes a big difference. It makes a difference in what their credit scores are gonna look like after college, mm -hmm. the kind of loan packages they're gonna get, the kind of scholarships they're gonna get. There's a big refer reverb effect, real research on that, so please, uh, if if you're a company or uh, another not-for-profit, please uh, reach out to FinEd50. Mine is to support you. <laughs> Same. Love her. Okay. <laughs> and also, think about that one unlikely bedfellow. Remember the drivers of financial freedom, even if it's someone in your industry or otherwise, that you could create a partnership, whether it's a narrative partnership, an actual content partnership, or whatever it is, to mobilize more people and more women in the space. So think about those bigger partnerships, especially with people you haven't thought about before that could actually move the needle. Yeah, well, thank you. So thank you. I'm gonna actually recap our takeaways in terms of an, um, the action items. So partnerships, supporting the Council for Economic Education, <laughs> making sure that we're going inside to focus on what our organizations are doing, looking at what we're doing and the role that we can play in this. And I think also making sure we do one thing and have one conversation when we leave this room. So thank you all. I really, really appreciate all that you've shared, your expertise and knowledge, and looking forward to being able to work with you beyond this conversation to move thank this work forward. Thank yeah. you so thank much. And thank you appreciate all for it. being a part Bye of this guys. conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much.